Today's first session is about green coding. And as developers, we have a lot of responsibilities. Um, we want to make our services ethical and inclusive. Uh, but how many of us actually think about the environment when we make our tech choices? Yeah, I mean, the party's over. <laughs> It's about time to take some new responsibilities. Uh, and yeah, uh, this session is a bit different, uh, maybe what you have used to. We're going to have both of our speakers on the stage uh, at the same time, and they're going to um, kind of interact during, during that. Um, there's Janne who is the chairperson of Koodia Suomesta Ryn, uh, so Code from Finland Association. And Satu, <laughs> who is on her way, <laughs> uh, she's the vice chairperson of, uh, of the Code from Finland Association. And there she is. Please. Welcome to the stage, <laughs> Janne. And Satu, who is actually coming all the way from uh, the reindeer border of Finland. Yes, and it is how it sounds like. Uh, past that border, no reindeers <laughs> should go. If they go more south, they will get captivated. But the north part, they can run wild and free. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, stage is yours. Okay. Kiitos. Okay, everybody. Good morning on my behalf too. So, if you didn't know that I'm Janne and she's Satu, so the, the Finnish, Finnish first names might be might be hard for for people that are non-Finnish or non-Estonian, so the, uh, just to keep in mind. But we both are here to talk about green coding, and we have been practicing it with a number of different forms for, uh, for many, many, many years. But uh, without further ado, let's, let's get started. So maybe, Satu, if you introduce yourself first. Yeah, my name is Satu Lapinlampi, and I'm the CEO of, of a uh, Oulu-based software company called Hiottu. I'm definitely not a coder, so if you, if you uh, at the end of our speech, you want to ask anything technical, please ask him. Yes, I'm Janne. I'm the chief growth officer and founder of Exove. And yes, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I, I am a coder. I yesterday coded with a, a new module for Magic Mirror to, on, on my, uh, next to our fridge at home. Didn't push it yet to GitHub because uh, I code so infrequently that I actually need to refresh my memory that I ha how do I set up a new new project in GitHub. But when I go through that tutorial for the seventh time, I probably get it get it up there, and then I have a new idea already already cooking up. So it's holiday season that I that the chief growth officers can code too. But today. We are not talking about about the magic mirror, even if I could talk about a lot about it. But the, uh, let's talk about about green coding. So we'll first talk about the, the why this is important. I, I think that I'll, I'll I'll do the most of talking that. Then Saku Satu, sorry, Satu will uh, talk about the our carbon neutrality sy symbol, and then also the dissect the, her company's emissions. Then I'll go through briefly that how the energy is consumed and what are the countermeasures in, in modern software. Then some final words and then there's a Q&A. The gist of Q&A is that you ask anything, we answer anything and then let's see how it goes. But Let's start with the, that why, why is this, this important, why, why we are talking about it here and, and hopefully why you are listening to us too. 
So. Well, I think this uh, picture says it all. We all have been reading news about uh, how uh, plants are uh, having problems because there are not enough insects anymore, how uh, polar bears are starving because there's not enough ice anymore, how there are huge forest fires in California, in Sweden, in Finland, everywhere, and how lakes are drying, how um, crop, uh, cows are not getting, uh, animals are not getting enough food because there's so, uh, so much drought, and, and how there are floods in the places where there shouldn't be floods. And, and we have been causing this all. Yes, the, everybody thinks that the digital is an activity that protects the environment, that we do things that help people not to do things awkwardly anymore. But that is not the whole truth, it's just part of the truth. And as they say, the, it, it's more complicated. So uh, the reality of digital emissions is, I would say, stark in that sense that, the, that they are growing really fast and they are causing, causing all kind of troubles. So, how many of you watch Netflix, HBO or something else instead of liner television? Hands up. Is there somebody that watching linear television instead of those services. Hmm. There's one person there. So, you probably now have guessed that the, the Netflix is way less efficient way of watching a movie than using a linear television. Because it's unicast and the linear television is a broadcast. Listening to a radio compared that you listen to Spotify is also better for the environment. I don't want anybody to raise hands if you are using crypto coins or cryptocurrencies, but shame on you. The Electricity consumption of Bitcoin, when I last checked, and this is, was after, the, after it went down, was the amount of energy consumed by the state of Argentina, which is a big country in South America, if you don't know. Uh, and the only need for the Bitcoin, what I have found out, is that it, it, it works sort of well if you're a drug dealer. If there is any other proper use instead of speculation, that kind of that you, you have a tulip trade going on, that kind of pyramid scheme that somebody gets rich and a lot of, lot of people will lose their money. If there's anything else that Bitcoin is used, then please let me know because I haven't found any. But it still frequently uses the power, the energy consumed by Argentina. And we could shut so many coal plants down if there would be no Bitcoin. Simply as that. The digital, digital emissions are hard to measure, they are hard to research because there is not that much uh, information available and then it has been watered down with marketing. The Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communication made, uh, was it 19 or 20, uh, climate and env environmental strategy for the ICT sector in Finland. That was the first climate and environmental strategy for IT sector in the world. And they estimated that we, all here, and everybody else in the ICT, we use 4 to 10 percent of the energy produced in the world. And the University of Lancaster made a study, this is sort of recent, 21, 22 maybe, that we produce something between 2.1 to 3.9 percent of greenhouse emissions. So average of that is 
squarely 3.0. And that is actually more than flying combined. And it's growing way, way faster. So if we take 3% of the global carbon emissions and then we take the UN emission report from 22, we get that we spew together 1.5 billion US billion tons of carbon dioxide every single year, and this is growing. And then it results to these kind of situations that I have few few colleagues and friends in Pittsburgh in a, in a technology conference like this. It's, it's about Drupal. I know, yes, it's, it's, it might not be sexy for everybody, but uh, but it's still a, still a very thriving community. And this was when there were people thinking that they would go to jog around Pittsburgh that don't do it right now. The image on the right is an image from New York from Tuesday. Canada is burning right now, and the, the forest fire season starts earlier every year. So there's no need to think that who is guilty, because we are all here. So I think that you, as a software professional, you know that software needs hardware to run. If somebody doesn't know, then, then please go back to the university and, and learn the basics. But yes, it actually does need hardware. And the cloud is just a fancy name that somebody else, else has a computer that you run the software on. The same report from the Ministry of Transport and Communications estimated that from 17 to 22, the global internet traffic quadrupled. So in five years, four, four times to grow. And that will continue. Of course, most of that stuff, if I look at my kids' kids' phones and what they are doing in the internet, it's, it's utterly shit. That there's no sense whatsoever that what people consume in the internet, but the, that, that's other other story completely, and it shows that I'm, I'm just, a, just a boomer, that the, uh, I don't understand the value of TikTok videos, for example. On the other hand, the real owner of the TikTok, the Chinese government, doesn't either understand the value, value of the videos because TikTok is banned in China. They have something else there that shows scientific videos and you can watch it only 90 minutes a day. This could be a good novel from the, from the 60s, like if Ray Bradbury's or, or, or others, that how the, how the Western society is consumed inside with, their, with our own tools. Anyhow, let's not talk too much about TikTok, but the, uh, the data consumption will grow. There is so many cool new technologies. There's the AI, there's IoT. They generate or they need a lot of data. There's a blockchain. This is for me still a solution that, that looks for a problem, but the, there might be some real uses that I don't really know, but I haven't sort of understand that what is the real value of blockchain that wh and why it consumes so much energy to perform things that you could do with a single line in a database. But yes, let's, let's not do that, go through that further. And then the metaverse is other system that got really boosted this week when Apple created their new uh, device that is not a VR device but something else, or AR device but something else. I don't know whether we are all looking through ski googles in the in the near future, and that is on, actually the only only valuable thing that I can think of. That when I was in the slopes, I could see that where my family is, there might be others too, but it's a hog of electricity with little added value. The data explosion. When the data explodes, the data needs to be stored, it needs to be transferred, it needs to be processed, because otherwise there's no value. We need to get information about of the, of the data, and there's a lot of data that we don't really get any, any value of. But we still hoard it because data is the new oil. The device capacities are increasing, so we get more processing power with less energy consumed. But there are limits. The Laws of physics 
will are sort of approaching slowly but steadily. And I think that nobody on the chip manufacturer side would like to go to jail because they would break the laws of physics. So most probably there is some end for that one. And then we just need more devices. Plenty, plenty of devices. Also, the consumers are teached by marketing. And, uh, and if you look, for example, if you read the words or the other Ars Technica, these kind of uh, journals, there's a new device. They say that this has better camera. This has more storage. This has more processing power. This has more of everything. And that's why it's better. And that means that your lousy old phone needs to be replaced, that you can get better pictures of your family or what, what you are taking at. And then most probably the extra pictures don't add any value to the photos anymore. But yes, it's still better. And then the coders, developers are extremely lazy. So we tend not to care about the old devices. So the software doesn't work. I have an iPad. The first generation iPad mini that is very good device and it has no problems whatsoever. But there's only one or two apps that work fluently anymore because they crash. The websites crash because the Safari has not been updated so much and there are so many good JavaScript applications running on a website producing no value to me, because I would like to just write to read the text. But they can't run, they crash the browser because they are so fancy. And because none of us has the tendency to test the system with old browsers. So I'm forced to upgrade my iPad mini after 10 years of loyal service soon, because I can't use it anymore. I can't watch Netflix on that sort of saves, saves the environment in that sense that I need to do something else. But I need to upgrade the device that is perfectly fine for my use because the software does not support the old device. And Apple is doing actually a good job compared to the Android, for example, that how old software is run. How many of you have uh, laptop that is less than one year old. How many of those people have selected top of the line laptop? You are part of the problem. <laughs> because you have too powerful laptop that you don't know that how shitty your code is. I have now a laptop that is an Intel Mac and it has get getting steadily worse during the past year. And my theory is that it was because M2 was launched. So the Chrome is slower, Slack is slower, every single thing is slower, but not on the M2 device. They are blazing fast. But I'm suffering and I need to upgrade my completely perfectly fine device because the coders did a lousy job of just adding new stuff and doing it because it runs fine on their machines. If my troubles are not worthy, change your habits, then think about this. My mother has Alzheimer on early stages. She has a PC that she uses to pay, pay the bills. If that PC would ever become unusable because of the software versions, she would not be able to learn the new system. No way at all. And then it would mean that every single month, I or my little sister should go to Northern Carolina 500 kilometers to pay the bills with something else because she could not use the lab computer anymore because she had to upgrade because of the software. There are a lot of social context included in these two. And let's talk about waste. 
sorry, the electronic waste is the fastest growing type of waste in the world, 7% annually. It's tremendous amount of electronic waste. 5,000 Eiffel Towers you could build with that. Only 17% of that waste is treated properly. And rest is, for example, smuggled to Africa, where it ends to riverbeds. You go to Sahel region, you take the Western devices that we donate to the poor Africans. There's so much small pink dust in the air that the old winds become stuck in a month, and then they are dumped. They can be found in riverbeds in those regions, or just, just buried in the ground. No recycling, nothing whatsoever. And then if you recycle things, then that, that consumes a lot of energy. You need to melt things down. You need, to, you need to scrap a lot of metal and so forth. And also that if you have an aluminum body laptop, the aluminum can be completely recycled. But if you have a carbon fiber laptop, the carbon fiber cannot be recycled. If you use your laptop only for three years, you will every, instead of four years or five years, you will have a way bigger carbon footprint because 80% of the footprint of your laptop or any other consumer level device comes from the manufacturing and logistics and only 20% from the usage. So if you can extend the usage, you will take small step on, on your behalf to make the world better. The ICT industry logic is based with very few exceptions that we bring new stuff to the market, new features, new solutions. Time to market, if you are working in SaaS, you need to just crunch things that we have new features, there's, there's this and that and whatnot. And then if you are in software consulting like I am, then the client said, okay, how long and how much? Those are the two critical questions. And then you, me, as a developer, we think mostly that how we can make our, our work easier. There's so much craft on the modern stack that is there just because that the developers are so lazy and it adds simply no value to the world at all, except to the developers, but it consumes so much energy. There was a study made by Lappert and the University of Technology that the people typically use around 5% of the code of every library that they use. But the library gets sent over the wire to the device. And that library, especially if you are working with JavaScript, and I think that most of you are because you are here, the library is using a library that is using a library that is using a library and so forth. And if all of those use only 5% of the code, you end up really small numbers are up like the fifth library down the line. How many of you remember the issue with left pad library? Um, yeah, so the story goes so that the left pad library was abandoned, then somebody, some random Chinese guy go, uh, picked it up and promptly put their uh, Bitcoin miner and then released a new version. And then a lot of other projects started to uh, add, the, add the library there. It was found really quickly that this is not the, my point, that then it was fixed and so forth, but there was like 10,000 different libraries affected. And what left that does, it, as the name says, it pads left. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that you could do that with single line of JavaScript. There might be even a ready-made function in JavaScript string, string a prototype to do it, but instead people opted, opted to use a library because either they don't read the documents they don't know how to code, or they are lazy. You can pick which one. If you, if you use these kind of libraries, then, then you can think that what kind of person you are. And that really sucks. Because unlike in mobile apps, where they strip the unused code, the dead code, in the, when, they, when, it goes to the, when you submit the code the, to the uh, app stores, they will strip the code. But in web, they, nobody does it, unless you have that in your build pipeline. So it might be that for some really small function, you add a library that is only 100, 100 kilobytes. And then it's downloaded by millions of people. 
instead that there would be like two lines of code that you actually need. Of course, this doesn't mean that everybody just needs to write everything from scratch, because then there will be more mistakes. We need to extend the environmental responsibility software development, that we need to curb the em energy consumption and emissions. And I must say that the, the renewables are not the answer, because there's the principle of the last, last uh, power plant, and that's always coal, that if there's more energy used, then somewhere a coal plant is fired up. Okay, so let's talk more about the solutions that there, hopefully there's some kind of common understanding that yes, we do have a problem, but we also have solutions. We don't want to talk that, okay, the world is going to, do, going to burn and so forth. Yeah, one of the solutions um, is this carbon neutrality symbol. Uh, first, we must tell that we are both uh, board members of this uh, Kodia Suomesta RY, uh, Code from Finland Association. It was started in Tampere by a company called Vincit as a campaign to, to uh, embrace and, and to um, benefit Finnish, uh, Finnish software industry and, and to make sure that Finland as a society uh, improves and, and is a good place for uh, coders to live in. And um, then we uh, turned it into an association and it's no more a campaign anymore, uh, or not just a campaign. And we really work hard uh, to, to improve Finland and, and to um, make the Finnish society better. And, and um, we have 250 members in this society. Some uh, are really small companies, like one person or two person, but uh, the biggest ones are well, big in, in the scale of Finland. And, um, well, if you ever see this symbol on a web page, you know that this company is a member of our association. And it means that uh, at least 80% of the uh, company's software production is made in Finland. It doesn't mean that the software developers have to be Finnish persons, like they, ha they don't need to have Finnish nationality. It, it, it's not a racist symbol. It just means that the work is done here in Finland. And the tax are paid in Finland. That is always crucial to Finns, that where the tax are paid. Yeah. And we are happy taxpayers. And like I said, at least 80% of the work or the value has to be uh, from the work done here in Finland. It could be that the member uh, is usually a company, but it, it's, it, the membership could have been applied for a product also. That's, that's possible too. But most of our members are companies. And one of the things we wanted to do um, to to help to, the, to solve the um, global problems was this symbol. We launched this symbol, um, I think, 18 months ago. And um, if, you want, if, if your company wants to have this symbol, uh, you have to uh, calculate your carbon footprint, you have to do the best to minimize it, and um, then you have to compensate your carbon footprint. And um, when you talk about um, cal calculating your carbon footprint, you usually uh, hear these scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three. But um, for software companies, they are not really so good because, well, the first scope is direct emissions. If, if you produce something like uh, furniture or, or um, buildings or cars, or if you own cars uh, as a company, then uh, those emissions would go to scope one. But if you think about it, you immediately realize that hardly any software companies have 
any uh, scope one carbon footprint. And a scope two is direct emissions from purchased energy. Well, that, that we all do have. But most of our emissions go to scope three. And if, if it's like scope one is zero, uh, scope two is like, I don't know, 20% and 80% of our emissions go to, to scope three, it's not really transparent. It's hard to see what is there and what is not. So we decided that we will um, do our calculations slightly differently. And here are um, our first carbon neutral companies who have earned this uh, symbol. As you can see, the footprints are quite uh, different in size. Of course, bigger companies with more employees have... Well, well I'm not sure if it's of course. But usually, uh, bigger companies have, with more employees have bigger footprints. I think it could be different, but it's usually not. Um, Exove is a big company. Fraktio is a big company. Hiottu, uh, where I work, is, is a smaller company. We have 16 people. And um, Concepto is a small company. They have six people. Lyuti is a big company. Trail Openers is a small company. It's a startup. And <clears throat> just to give a background, the Citra, one of the think tanks in Finland, calculated that the average carbon footprint of an office worker, we all are office workers, believe it or not, is, was it 9,000? No, 4,400. 4,400, 4, okay. Uh, no, no, that, that was Citra employers, uh, employees' yeah. footprint, and they said it's uh, slightly smaller than average. Okay, so it's around five. So we are doing mm. all of us, all of the companies are doing better than average, and then they have also changed to cha uh, become become carbon neutral with the with the compensation. Mm. And I'm definitely not saying that, for example, our company would would be better than uh, Luiti, for example. I'm saying that we have all been doing our best to. Um, minimize, and at least we have tried. And that's a bit more than can be said about most of the companies. And I'm um, going to share you now uh, our company's footprint as an example. And I'm not saying that we are perfect, like, like I said. We are doing our best, and I think that has to be enough. Those of you who are as old as I am know that, that this is a sentence from an excellent band called Midnight Oil. And I think this is an excellent question. How do we sleep when our beds are burning? Well, I'm the type of person who... Well, now there's a lot of talking about young people having climate anxiety. I have been having all sorts of anxiety since my early years. First, the war between, between Iran and Iraq, then the Cold War and, and the threat of nuclear bombing and, and so on. So all sorts of anxieties. And I have always been trying to do something. And one of the things I am trying to do now is to make sure that our company is as green as possible uh, so that it doesn't ma make life harder for our people. And Janne just said this uh, earlier, that this is the uh, quotation from Citra's blog. And for those who don't know what Citra is, Citra is a Finnish um, organization funded by our government. And its uh, mission is to think about future, to, to prepare Finnish society for the changes future will bring to us. And here is uh, our carbon footprint. I always uh, count it um, afterwards. So, so uh, like, I'm, I've now been counting or calculating the year 22. It, it is possible also to, to do the calculations based on, on the uh, revenue of your company, but I don't think that's the right way. If you just count the money, 
you are not, uh, it doesn't motivate you to improve the, the way you are doing the things. So that's why I've been calculating our uh, travels and, and commutes and, and office premises and, and stuff. Um, I'm still not finished with the last year's calculations. That's why the office space is marked with uh, gray, as well as the total and per person number. Because we moved uh, to a bigger office about a year ago, and I still don't have the right numbers. So I'm assuming that because we have now a double amount of square meters, our carbon emissions are double, but let's see. Uh, when I find it out, when I have the final numbers, I will put it on our web page. But as you can see, uh, I started the calculations 2020, which was the COVID year. So no traveling, no, no life at all, which set the, the limit quite low. And, and that's actually impossible to, to reach again because well, now we are uh, visiting our customers. Now we are visiting this sort of sort of events, and and all the traveling means that we have a bigger carbon footprint. But I don't I don't fly in Finland. If I have to visit the customer abroad, I probably will fly because otherwise it will take too much time and effort because there are no uh, clear. Uh, the, it, it's easier to uh, figure out how to fly from Oulu to uh, Tutlingen in Germany, than to how to take a train there. But um, in Finland I take a train, or I have an electrical car, so Tesla, so I'm driving that if, if I can't take a train. Uh, usually when companies are calculating their carbon footprint, they don't calculate or, or take the uh, commuting because, well, it's sort of extra and, and companies think that it's, it's my, up to me if, how I travel to work and back. But we decided to, to include it because, well, uh, our people wouldn't be coming to our office if, if it wasn't because of our company. So that's why uh, I've been calculating it too. And I've been calculating that uh, a bit uh, more pessimistically than it actually is. This English proverb is actually an excellent proverb. Little by little, a little becomes a lot. If you think about, um, well, if I think about myself and, and what I can do to save the world or uh, to uh, decrease the, the global warming. It's not a lot, but I'm pretty sure that uh, an ant doesn't think like that. They think that if a billion ants can build a hive or nest uh, uh, taller than I am, then or, or they can move a fro bigger frog or a snake to their uh, home to, to eat it, then I think we should think the same way. I should do what I can do, and if all of us think that uh, I should do what I can do, it, it will make a difference. And that difference is really important. The, here are some examples of the little thing, things we do. Like I said, traveling mainly by land. I'm not the kind of boss who tells people what they must do or must not. I just make uh, wishes and set an example. And when I travel by land, I encourage other people to also travel by land. Um, like Jan was talking about hardware, I'm also always talking about that. And I'm always saying that we don't, we don't just get a new laptop or new phone because there's a new, newer model available. We get them when it's necessary. I had my previous laptop for five years, and now it's, uh, it belongs to an Ukrainian refugee lady who can now uh, start working in, in Oulu with, with that laptop. 
Um, when we buy some furniture, we always check if there is a pre-loved furniture available. When we moved to bigger office, I really had to buy a lot of stuff, mainly used. This sofa, is, this, this photo is from our office. Uh, the sofa was pre-loved and the previous owner was about to dump it, but I asked that if we could get it. Um, I was planning to put a uh, glass or other uh, surface on those. I have no clue what, what they are, the, those. I, pellets. Yep, pellets. Uh, but I've been so lazy that <coughs> it's not there yet. And we've been surviving quite well already over a year without it. So it probably won't happen. Oh, and by the way, that uh, sort of cactus there, it's our Christmas tree. In, in Finland, one of the, the domestic plants people have in their homes is called joulukaktus. So this is our Christmas cactus. It even has, has lights for the Christmas time. Um, and, of course, if there is no pre-loved furniture available that suits our needs, then we'll, we will buy new stuff. But my pro, pro tip is that don't ever buy anything fashionable, because if you buy something that is trendy, it will soon be untrendy and it will start looking dated. That's my philosophy. Um, then I've been uh, smuggling, for example, oat milk into our office uh, coffees. I first started bringing some oat milk next to regular milk and then added the amount of uh, oat milk. And now they've been drinking just oat milk for two years without realizing that the change happened. That's, of course, that's because coders are the, the best colleagues in the world and they are the kindest colleagues in the world. That's why it's possible. That's why I get to um, realize my... Uh, willingness to improve the world every day. They don't mind it. They, they let me do my stuff as long as, as it doesn't bother them. And next on my to-do list is company-provided uh, bikes to, to encourage people to come to the work um, using other transportation than cars. And this is a bonus that each and every CEO or company owner should be interested in. If you are doing ecologically wise uh, choices, you are also saving money. That's a bonus, I think. Making wise uh, choices uh, uh, is, of course, valuable as, it, uh, as itself. But that's a good bonus. And again, midnight oil. The time has come to say fair is fair, to pay the rent, to pay our share. And that is the compensation. To, the amount to offset uh, last year was uh, 10,000 kilos. Well, I'm, I'm not a technical person, and I, for some reason, I always end up miscalculating when I'm doing the compensation. And I usually compensate two and a half, half times instead of two times. It, it's, it just happens for some reason every time. But it's not a bad mistake. But that's why I have this double mark, because it's never really a double, it's always a bit more. And I'm doing the double comp compensation because I I know there are mistakes in my calculations. There's always something I have forgotten, because I'm not a very organized person, and I'm not perfect, far from that. So that's why I'm, I'm playing safe here. And I've been uh, compensating by Hiilinieluregisteri, which is a Finnish uh, service to uh, compensate the carbon footprint. And then uh, I have been compensating using gold standard approved projects. Um, I don't think you can see it, but the last time, uh, the first time the gold standard compensation went to Rwanda, and this time it uh, went to India. 
And now to the technical part. Thanks. <clears throat> so that was the part that what your company can do. If you are the owner of the company, then just start doing it. If you are an employee, then told your boss that maybe we should do something about it. Because there's a lot of ways to do it. And sooner or later, only ec ecologically friendly companies will try because there's no business on a dead planet. But let's talk about the <clears throat> what you can do, because you can do a lot. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the generic architecture of modern software is that there's an end-user device, then there's a network, and then there's the data center of the cloud. And that's that how we roll. There's different kind of end-use devices. There are things that run on battery. A lot of people are using those right now, so maybe we are speaking a bit dull here. Uh, then, there are the, then there are the wired devices. And it typically goes so that if the system is battery powered, then it's very energy efficient. And when it's not battery powered, it's not that energy efficient. How many of you know that how much your television consumes energy per hour? Two people. That's better than average. Typically, there's one person. How many of you know that how much your en uh, television consumes energy when it's shut down? Yes, that is, uh, that is something that uh, people use as a sales argument. But then if you watch it two, two hours a day, then the energy consumption of, of the idle mode might not be that different. It depends, of course, how much it consumes. The network, it can be wireless, 3G, 4G, 5G, soon 6G, Wi-Fi, or it could be wired, there's copper, there's the optic fiber. And the difference between the worst, that is 4G, because 3G is phased out, and the best, that is optical fiber, is around 10,000 times fold. So, moving one byte on 4G uses the same amount of energy that moving 10 kilobytes in optical fiber. So, in a data center, there's hardware that consumes energy when the software that you are building is in use. There are the web servers, the application servers, databases, there's a bunch of other servers on the server side. And also the firewalls, the VPN endpoints, the network equipment, backups, restore, storage, log platforms. There's platform for every single need, and they might be also outside the data center in some other data center and then you have communication between those two. And then the internal con connectivity inside the data center, and the cloud is really a fancy name for having a data center. The network is the, when if you think about the energy consumption, is the connection between the end user device and the data center and the cloud. Also, it may, might be that if you are using some other system that you communicate between data centers. The last mile connection is the most crucial one, where the energy is consumed. Everything else is really negligible. That it doesn't really that much matter if the user is using 4G, and yet then you push out huge videos there. Also, the end user device might and will, most probably, will connect to a number of back-end servers using different networks. We are using a network system that has been designed to sustain operations in the case of nuclear war. So it finds the route to communicate between two servers, and the route might be different every single packet, because it needs to be resilient. That means that it's not the most energy efficient system, because the, it, it looks for the fastest route, and it's not always the energy, and there's no way to, for the networks to know that which route is consuming energy more than others. And then if you have a number of, if you analyze your own softwares, 
uh, running on, on, on a mobile device, that to which systems it connects, where those are located, are they in the States, are they in Europe, has they need to be in China because of the local laws, or in Russia if somebody would do business with Russians nowadays, but back in the days when that was still sort of uh, approvable, let's put this way, they had, they had and they, they still have a law that, uh, that you need to keep the, keep, the, keep the data inside Russia. And now they do completely keep the data in, inside Russia because nobody wants to have the data out there. But let's not dwell in that too much. And then the end user device, laptop with a browser, a mobile phone with a browser, there might be a native app or React native app or, or some other Flutter stuff there. Smart television, voice assistant, you name it. Gaming console. And then your system, your software is using some of the energy used by, this, by the device. But not all, because there are other processes. There's somebody else's, some evil twin of yours is also running their software on that device. And you don't really know, nobody has really easy way to measure that how much each part of the software is using the energy of the, of the system. And this is simplification. There is probably at least somebody that's batting their nails. That it, it's not that easy, it's not that simple. And I do know it. There are way more actors in the play in the real world. Use of content delivery networks might complicate things. Caching to reduce process usage in the data center or reduce the amount of stuff transferred over the network and so forth. But the basic model is still valid. And we need simple models because we are at the end very simple beings and we can't understand very complex things. There's the rule of seven plus minus five that when people have more than seven things, they split that into two groups and then you have two things. So it's better to have three things instead of having one thing. But if you start to figure out that how much your software consumes energy, you need to split all of this down. It doesn't mean that, yes, my network, I have one network, I have one server, I have one, one device, but you have millions of devices, you have different kind of networks and so forth. And all of that depends. That is the, when I, the, the how to say, the senior software engineer are answer to any question to start that it depends. And this, this is all the same case, that how the energy is, measured, how the energy use is measured, and I always say that it depends on the case, and let's talk. So, the end user device consumes energy by having a display that is on. There's CPU, there's GPU, there's network connection, there might be GPS, there might be other sensors, all kind of fancy stuff. Very optimized hardware when they are running battery powered and not so when they are plugged into in the wall socket. Actually, television is the only IT system or IT hardware that has energy labels. So we have more efficient fridges than laptops or gaming devices. There will be, the European Union has plans to add the energy labeling to the IT hardware and that is due time. Because if you haven't noticed, they created the energy labels for the fridges and the others. And then the fridge makers and the other makers of other stuff to kitchen appliances made way better systems, so they had to revamp the energy labels because everybody was going to the roof on the sort of positive side. So it actually worked. And EU, the best gift to the world what EU provides is, is actually regulations. EU has 500 million people, all very, very well doing in the, in the global sense where the average daily, daily salary for a person is around one dollar. So we are wealthy, all of us. Even in Romania and Bulgaria, where other, like, like the right-wing people say that they, maybe they are too poor and we should sort of avoid that they come here to uh, live on our social welfare and then also take our jobs simultaneously. So the, uh, anyhow, the, we are doing really well and we have a lot of consuming power. 
and with regulation we use that power that everybody else in the world have the benefits to that because you don't want to make appliances only to EU but you make them globally so everybody else's devices get better with energy consumption because EU regulates and nobody else doesn't need to regulate. So whenever you think bad about EU and the regulation, think that they are saving the world. Nobody else is actually doing that. Nobody else cares. Because most of the Western world is run with that the money goes over ideology. And that's why we don't understand Russia where the ideology always goes above money. And EU actually puts the ideology on top of money too, that we can suffer if the world is better on finance and suffer. Yes. So, screen is the biggest hog of energy on all of these devices. They are bright, they are big. And if somebody is still using a, a screen saver, then turn it off. It's complete waste of energy. Nobody's looking at the screen when, it, when it's been saved. You can just turn it off. The network is the easiest part to measure because there is a lot of measurement at how much kilowatts are consumed when you move a gigabyte of data. And then the data center, there's the electricity consumption of the server, storage, internal network, very optimized hardware that is designed to be run on full throttle. So if you have your own data centers or if you have a badly optimized data center that has like 100 servers running with 40% load, you would be way better off having 50 servers running with 80% load. Of course, if you have already bought those servers, then, then, you are, then you are stuck. But if you would not be in that case, then trying to squeeze as much stuff in any, every single server reduces the amount of servers built. And that saves the planet partially. So in that sense, running stuff in cloud with, with lambdas and the others, that kind of microservices, Makes sense because you can, st you can stack them very, very easily. You can fill the servers with the, with the load. All ener as I mentioned earlier, the all energy production causes emission, <coughs> including the renewables. We need to manufacture the, the windmills. They don't sprout up from the ground. We can't sort of sow them. Logistics, getting them there in the, in the woods of Finland, operating them. They need to be oiled, for example. They need to be dismantled. They need to be cleaned. And then we go to the darker and darker, dirtier energy, ending to a coal plant. The countries have very big differences. Finland is becoming a power nation of clean energy quite recently. There was huge, huge amount of wind power sort of uh, investment plans to Finland. Was it like that we, five, that we quadruple, I don't know what is the five times, it, it has probably a fancy word, but, the, but we five make, make the, grow the capacity five times bigger in the, in the near future because it makes sense to get wind power in Finland. The other Nordic countries, they have a lot of, lot of hydroelectric power, so we are clean. So the Finnish coefficient for energy, when I wrote, wrote my book about green coding in last year's fall, was 54 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. It's actually a pretty big amount. If you consume one kilowatt hour, then you produce 54 grams. It's like... A, candy bar is probably 30 to 50 grams. So that's much amount of, of uh, carbon dioxide. It's due to the, uh, to the atmosphere when you use one kilowatt hour of energy. But in Germany, in 21, the average coefficient was 349 grams. So it was eight times more than the Finnish one. So instead of one candy bar, you could get the box of chocolate with the one kilowatt hour. If you go to Bosnia, 
it's more than one kilo, then you would get a lot of candy. So the, uh, but dirty candy. Renewable or carbon offsetting energy does not solve the problem, it just moves it away to some other location. There's always somebody that doesn't care about the energy still, the, the cleanness of the energy. But it makes producing the renewables more alluring. And that's why it's paramount to save the energy. And also, when the electricity is cheap, there's one pro tip, that when the electricity is cheap, it's always clean. So, you could change your software that if you have a lot of hard, tedious back-end calculations, do them then when the energy is cheap, because then you are using renewables. Don't do them when energy is, is expensive, because then it's coal or gas-based energy, where the, money, where, the, where the price comes from. And that's actually a gift from the EU's regulation, because we have the carbon, uh, I don't know what is the English, the carbon, sort of carbon tax that we need to give the, uh, you need to buy the emission, emission tickets that you can uh, release emissions, and that has a cost. And the cost is actually growing very dramatically. I've been referring to the hardware a few times, so manufacturing, logistic usage, and dismantling are the phases where the energy is consumed. Actually, dismantling reduces emissions it's done properly because then it reduces the need for raw materials. 80-20 rule is here too, that if you have a end user device, then 80% of the energy is used when it's manufactured and 20% when it's used. It's a bit less, but around that. But if you have a hardware for the server side, then 20% of the energy is used in production, 80% in production. Oh, no, sorry, in, in usage. So the, uh, they are, they use way more lot energy than the, our consumer devices compared to the, to the manufacturing. Measuring energy consumption is hard. There are several systems running on the same platform. You can't really easily go inside the device to measure the energy usage. Data centers don't provide extra information. This is not mandated, so they don't do it because they don't care. Uh, there might be different networks in use with, between the data center and the and the uh, and and the <coughs> the communication or the end user devices, and then there are CDNs, cache, and all all other stuff. Would you click once? It's it's not click mouse once. Yes. Yes, but if you can't measure, there is a good way, good rule of thumb. The University of Beira Interior in Portugal made a measurement with uh, around 20 different programming languages, and they found always with every single programming language, they were found a strong or very strong correlation between the execution time and the electric consumption. But longer the system runs, the more energy it uses. And everybody thinks that yes, that's that is probably true because it's, it makes perfect sense. But on the other hand, if the system or the programming language or the implementation of the algorithm used more memory, then it didn't correlate whatsoever, not, so, not at all with the usage of electricity. So it, it's not that straightforward, but this is scientifically proven even if there has been all kind of small flaws in the, between, the, between the language, so don't take this with that okay, the, TypeScript is bad and we should all, all go in Rust and so forth because that is one way to actually interpret the uh, recommendations or, not, or the results. That is not the case. But more that with any language, the faster your system is, the less, it, less energy it uses. And then less data you transfer, the less energy you use, the less hardware you use, the less emissions are caused. So less is less in all of these. And you can measure with the clock. Then, in my book, I try to find a metaphor 
that how to how to how to make the energy saving saving sort of understandable because if you can't measure it, then what you gonna do? So, in one phone call with our actually our sales director, that was very good at listening to my babbling. Uh, I found out that the waste in lean manufacturing is excellent concept for this one. So waste in lean manufacturing and in, in lean, lean all stuff is defined as an action that does not add, add value to the customer and lean manufacturing tries to remove all that waste. Because if it doesn't add value, then why we are we doing it? And we can use the same metaphor in software development to reduce the energy consumption. That by if there is a thing that doesn't add value to the user but uses energy, we should get rid of it. There is number of ways, and I, I found these when, when, I, when I studied the subject, when I figured out things, when I thought about it and discussed with a number of people, I found different kind of ways. There are different kind of ways these also in the lean, so lean uh, manufacturing, and this is about energy consumption. Though there might be redundant software, software that is not used. Or software, for example, a system that probes other systems that is not in use anymore, but it still probes and maybe complains every now and then that not, nobody's here, and that is, the, that is just okay. So just shut it down. You can use software in a wrong task, There's that you, you sort of fight against the system and use a lot of countermeasures against your own software and consume a lot of energy. A user error is not a straightforward, but then if user makes an error and the software complains that, okay, the computer says no, they try again. And they might be really persistent trying again and again and again and again. And every single time, no value is added, but cycles are consumed. The best way to avoid is that never ask anything from the user. Sometimes you can't avoid asking the user. But then, if possible, use the information that is already stored by your system. In Estonia, that is way ahead of any other country in the world with the, with the IT, governmental IT, they have a law that the government can't ask an individual the same thing twice. So if government knows my name, and I log in with my social security number using the... the uh, smart card or the mobile ID or whatnot, they can't ask my name again because they already know it. But the systems need to talk with each other. And not like, not like in Finland where every single system is in their own silo and stays there. Because otherwise it might be that if you start to rely on somebody else, they actually have an upper hand and you have the lower hand and that would not cut. So we are not that eager to do the do uh, sort of cooperation. And Estones are very similar to us, so that's why they make the law that it's illegal not to cooperate on government side. One of the laws that actually affects the government and not to the people, it's for the best of the people. And that, that is one of the key reasons why Estonia is so, f the e-Estonia stuff is so fluent to use, because the system works for you and you are not working for the system. Anyhow, wrong architecture, you use the system to something that is not designed for, or you have a wrong data model. Probably you have seen these. Nobody typically said, yes, let's start the pro process with the wrong, wrong architecture, and hey, let's have the wrong data model, but they just end up being there. Then there's extra data that you store, process, transfer, and maybe even fetch data that is not needed old information, too, too long log files, just for the cause of it. GDPR make a good cause that most of the log files are now cut in 30 days, because otherwise you need to purge the log files when somebody makes a GDPR request to remove their data. So the GDPR in that sense started to save energy. Unoptimized data, too big transfers, using wrong formats and so forth. Transferring data for the sake of certainty happens easily, especially in the web environment, that you don't really know that what's in the, in the, in the client side or whether the server knows this, whether this has come true, so that's, let's just push everything there and, and be with it. 
And then the typical when people, when I have asked developers that how to how what is wasting the data that the algorithmic inefficiency that somebody has made bad code. But it's it's actually pretty small problem because of the use of the libraries, use of the ready-made systems, and we are more of building the software from Lego bricks nowadays. Then there might be that the user is deceived. You might have all encountered system that is really hard to cancel the subscription. You don't really find the cancel button, but you go around and around and around the system to find it out. Or it asks your contract number, for example, to verify that you are you, but of course it allows you to consume all the services without knowing that you are you, but when you want to cancel, then no, no, it won't work. Or that the people are sort of moved from page to page to page to page before they can actually write a customer case ticket. That you need to go all hoops and loops. Different kind of dark patterns. And then the too much code that there's bloated with code that is not used. Or that you use only corner of a library. You could use also wrong programming language. There are differences in the efficiency. JavaScript is not the best one, it's not the worst one either, but uh, it's not efficient language. Of course, the joy of coding everything in C is, is also something that if you have not experienced yet, I, I truly suggest that you, you take that kind of uh, e uh, <coughs> exercise. I once made a system that optimizes HTML, removes stuff in HTML in network equipment written in C, and I see so only 200 bytes or something like that, a rolling buffer. It was extremely interesting exercise to make that it doesn't break that much the HTML that it trips because it can't build the DOM tree, but it just reads bytes. But uh, I'm a stronger person because of that nowadays. Then there's waste of initialization if your system boots up every single time that every single request or every hundred requests, every thousand requests, the system sort of is booted up. <coughs> that happens with lambdas, with PHP, with Perl, Python. Then you initialize everything, and then use only 10% of the initialization. So maybe do that gradually. And then all kind of extra stuff. <coughs> Eye candy, animations. We have so fast devices that the users don't see the change in the screens that they, what they saw in the 80s, that you actually could wait and now wait and wait and now it updated. You could see, see that and sometimes you could actually see that where the update goes on the screen. Now everything is instant, so you need to add animations so that people can actually see the change. And that animation is sort of waste. Maybe you could just pause the update that it, it's like uh, more than 100 milliseconds because after that the people psychologically see the change before that they don't. As said, the waste removal depends. There are no hard and fast rules for doing it. You need to be a senior level person. I guess that most of you are because you have ended up here. Uh, you need to understand the system very well to spot the waste. Then you need to analyze the impact of the waste and impact of removing the waste. And then based on the analysis, then you either remove the waste and then you left it intact because this is not something, okay, let's cut this stuff out. There might be some marketing manager that comes crying after you in a month when they found out that you cut the system that produces the KPIs. So there's two matrices. On the y-axis, there's the impact of the change, and then the, on the x-axis, there's the amount of work. If the impact is large and the amount of work small, then just do it. And then if the impact is small and the amount of, of work is large, then just do not do it. And then everything in between, this is sort of makes simple, or makes, makes sense and it's very simple. But then the other one is about the user experience. And then user experience can, can become worse or it can become better. Of course, if there's a large impact that you improve the user experience, just do it right now. If there's a large change that, or large impact that 
uh, worsens the user experience heavily, then think very carefully what could be done. And then the small, chain, small impacts that, that, that worsen the user experience should not be done and so forth. These are in, in the book that I'll, I'll maybe have the, have the URL at the, at the end of the slides. Maybe not, let's see. And then some practical solutions that this is not just a hand waving. Uh, there's a number of different ways to reduce the energy consumption. And this I've selected a few, few ones, there's more in the, in the book. Uh, this is, these are web focused because we just live in a connected web. And I think that this is, this is appropriate for the, for the audience too. Reduce amount of data transfer. Transferred. Use proper formats if possible. Use WebP instead of ping and, and JPEG files. You save 10 to 20 percent. Cash when you can, if you have a good cash strategy and you are fluent with caching, that you actually understand what the system does. Because if you are not fluent with caching, you can shoot your both legs in simultaneously. Compress everything that is possible. Compress everything that is possible in the pipelines, in the build pipelines, if, if you can do that. Compress once, decompress a million times is extremely efficient formula. But also on the fly compression makes sense. Minimize possibilities for errors. Reduce amount of videos. Uh, replace them with animation because they compress better. Or static images or set of static images or just simple plain text or Sometimes they are not needed at all. Reduce data transfer frequency to how quickly your system pulls. That might be also that when the user is interacting with the system, that it pulls more frequently, and when it's idling, the user is idling, also the pulling is idling, because there's no need to update something that the user is not present. Remove dead code, because that gets transferred to the other part of the network easily. And then about the libraries, be mindful. Check whether you can cope without the library, without well, or selecting a different library, or can you copy the stuff from the library if the license allows. Don't write your own libraries because you end up making more mistakes. There's a the Thousand Eyes, Eyes Made Buck Shallow in, uh, in the, in the well-used libraries. Also, the library implementations, that there's some algorithms back in the good old 80s, when the, there was no parallelism in the processors, are less optimi optima optimal nowadays. So make sure that you have also a recent implementation of the algorithms, and the algorithm fits the amount of data that you have. Because some algorithms are really fast with small amount of data, and stumble are very, very bad with, uh, with uh, large amount of data, and then some algorithms are vice versa. So again, think about it. Find the hotspot of the software and focus on optimizing them. Don't spread the optimization to all the systems. Don't do premature local optimization, but you need to focus on the bigger picture. Write the algorithms, as, as mentioned. And then if there are needs to use a different language, then consider that too. But remember that the bridge between two different languages, there's also the environment, might be costly. So it, it might be end up that you actually lose energy because you need to transfer data between two environments and the bridges with all the language environments are not that easy. And then the final words. This is a journey. What Sato spoke, what I have speak, spoken, don't expect that all changes can be done at once. That's the easiest way to get anx anx anxiety and depression, that you take everything that I'll now solve all of this, and then you find out that I can't do it, <clears throat> it's not your fault, this is not a simple problem, but this is systemic problem, this is system level, global level problem. You can and you must do your part, but don't expect more, <clears throat> because if you are depressed and laying on your bunk the whole day, then there's somebody way less green person doing your job. 
and the world is suffering. So keep good, good care of your mental, mental health too. And then remember that if you are in client business or you have internal clients, at the end there's always the user, the, the, the client for the software, that if they are satisfied, you have way bigger room to maneuver on these things. But if you are late, over the budget, and under the, under the features, and then you go say that we should go green, and then the, the client would say that no way, that there are these kind of things that I would like you to implement first. So keep the client satisfied and you can make changes. Don't set too ambitious goals and don't try to gobble everything up at once. It won't work. You just get tired and that, that's no, no good. With every single journey, <clears throat> every path that we take, the most important thing is to take the first step and I congratulate you all because you have already all taken the first step by being here. Now just you need to take the next steps. And I wish you best of luck with that journey. And if you are interested, then my book is freely available in PDF and text version. The text version is one-tenth of the size of the PDF version. And if you have been coding in the, in the swinging 90s, then, then you might have uh, some spike of nostalgia looking at it. It has ASCII graphics and all this shit, so the, uh, check that out. We just want your email address in the exchange for the book. Available in Finnish and available in English. That's it. Now, any questions or comments? Thank you, Satu and Janne. Uh, that was enlightening. I sold all my bitcoins during that <laughs> speech. Uh, but um, we have tons uh, of questions. So um, if, you're, if you want to have a coffee now, uh, feel free to uh, leave. But we could sit down and um, go through a bit of these questions. Okay, um, let's start with the most wanted ones. Um, what about, sorry, what about bandwidth not in terms of energy consumption but in terms of emitting electromagne <laughs> electromagnetic waves which are also dangerous for nature, nature especially 5G? Like I said, I'm not the technical person, so go ahead, Janne. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay. <coughs> let's not talk. Let's not go to the details that whether it's dangerous or not. But uh, yes, uh, if you reduce the amount of data transfer, then you will reduce also the amount of uh, amount of the the radiation or the the waves. So in that sense, it's, yes, it works that way. Okay. Uh, and can a company be considered uh, uh, carbon neutral if their software is for fracking industry or if the business is pushing commercial to social media to buy new stuff? Well, our whole society is based on consuming. So, um, I, know, I know that's a dilemma and but, but like we both said, uh, no one's perfect. And if a company, for example, let, let's say a company in fashion industry, for example, um, changes from um, the cheap uh, shine style products to uh, more ecological products and, and encourage their customers to buy less but buy better quality, I would say it's definitely ecological, even though it's... Uh, advertising in social media. It's sort of the, the balance of scales. Yeah, and I think that the, <clears throat> the choice of customers you make is, is more of ethical one, that it's, that uh, if you have, a, let's say, a fracking company as your client, 
then you being a carbon neutral is still better for the environment, notwithstanding your clients, so I would not use that as an excuse. Then whether you should serve that kind of clients of like tobacco companies, alcohol gambling, there's a list of these is, is growing. It's not about the carbon emissions of your company. It's about the choices that you make. Of course, somebody is serving those companies. And if it ends up that certain industries are only served by companies that don't care about the emissions, and then they get bigger because they have uh, clients that need to buy by any cost the services, then you're actually doing a disfavor to the planet. So it's, it's not simple. Mm. You need to you think from re very different angles. And for example, our company, um, well, uh, we are somewhat picky when we are choosing our customers. We are, we are not working with any, any customer. Yeah, as a developer, uh, you don't always get to choose to what industry actually built uh, the software for. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's like, yeah, I can skip this library, but really I'm just selling uh, products for like, or doing this product for like fashion companies. So what's the, mm -hmm. what's the point <laughs> then? But yeah, we can, we can do our part um, and let the <laughs> rest of the world worry about the rest. Um, Advising anti-consumption uh, in an economic system that is built on consumerism seems impossible. Can we simply go green and hope to continue exponential growth? Mm. I think that the <clears throat> the there's I think that there's like three scenarios that we either don't sustain the exponential growth. That's one thing. What where that brings, I don't know. It, it's something that is, will be different. Then there's the other one that we can find ways to sustain the, economical, uh, the, the exponential growth. That would be most probably with digital, that we would move more and more things to digital. That sort of counters our point here. But on the other hand, if we end the situation that the, all the energy in the world in 20, 30 years is, is carbon neutral, then that might work. Or the third one is that we just burn with the planet. So the price is not high enough yet that we would stop. And there is one third of the people with some uh, study said that I don't recall right now the, the exact title of the study, but said that around one third of the population is conservative people and they don't believe in these kind of things right now. They might believe in the in the when we think the 20s as the golden 20s, when we are in the, in the 50s or 60s, in the, in the in decades. So there's always that kind of counter momentum in the society that doesn't believe in the newest science and newest things because they think that the old ways were better and we can't do anything about that. So there's all, <coughs> the change is not easy the best that you can do is you do your own part. Mm. Don't buy stuff. The world will change because of that. Of course, where you will put all the money where you, that you, you get with the highly paid, highly paid uh, developer position is a good question. Maybe something that goes towards green, I don't know. But uh, that's what I've tried to do, that I, <coughs> I'm, <coughs> I'm using all the clothes that I bought, for example, the the shirt I, I have here, the t-shirt is 10 years old. I just two years ago found it in my closet that it's not, not that much use, so I decided I'll, I'll use it. So try to stop buying stuff. That is the easiest answer. The world will change if everybody will, will do that. But where we go, I don't know. That is interesting, but I, I know that the, the, there will be new ways in the future because then there will be uh, that there is a need or a must mm. to change, then the, the economy will adapt. Um, I agree with Janne, and, but uh, it, it's not the but. It's an, and in addition to what Janne said, um, well, 
I'm, I'm the kind of person who, who loves uh, clothing and jewelry. And um, if you look at me, you, you immediately don't think that I'm wearing secondhand stuff. But I am. My shoes were bought when they were uh, brand new. But secondhand, secondhand, even these earrings are secondhand from the 1980s. So um, I think there's a good chance that at least some of the, the consumerism will uh, um, shift to uh, borrowing uh, or renting or using pre-loved. Yeah, and I, I think we can see already those services appearing. I, I go to uh, Guys and Emmy in Helsinki to rent all my clothes, so <laughs> it's handy. Um, okay, uh, why we don't have more solar-powered data centers? There are significantly, significantly less of them in comparison with non-sustainable data centers and computing servers. I think it's because what Janne said, that one-third of uh, people are conservative and they prefer the old way of, of doing things. And when those people are in the positions where they make the decisions, the uh, development is really slow, too slow for, for our kind of people. And, and when I say our kind of people, I also mean all the software developers who usually are loving the, the um, improvements and loving the changes and, and loving the new stuff they can do. But there's a, yeah, it's also the, that how, how secure is the source of the energy that is solar powered, uh, what the, where the data center gets the, gets the power during the night. And uh, there's a, and then also the, there are the geopolitical risk and the others that you need to prepare for those. There's a, in Mansala, it's a, it's 50 kilometers north, maybe 70 kilometers north from, from Helsinki. There's a, it's a small town, and they have a data center of Yandex there. And the uh, Yandex is a Russian company, and they don't have an electricity contract. Nobody wants to sell them electricity in Finland. So they are running the whole data center with, with gasoline because they can get that because one of the gasoline chains is owned by Russians in Finland. So the, uh, it's not always straightforward. They, and the, the funny thing with the, with the index was that the Mansella Energy uh, used the heat generated from the, by, the, by the data center to heat the homes of the town. They won't do it anymore because of the sanctions. So there was like double the loss. And you need to prepare for all these kind of things when you're a data center owner. And that's why you need to select systems that are proven. And then somebody needs to be the sort of uh, living in the edge to do those things. The, for example, that's why there's a lot of, lot of uh, data centers built in, in Finland and northern Sweden that there is a hydroelectric power and there is cool climate that you don't need to uh, have that much uh, air conditioning inside the data center because the the atmosphere is cooler. So they take those into action. But for example, when I asked in September last year with the, with the, within one of the architecture conference that I was speaking at, there was a data center guy speaking also that whether they fluctuate the uh, temperature inside the data center based on the electricity price, like two cent two centigrades or three centigrades, they said, nobody's ever thought of that. So there's also that the, and they might be worried about the conditions of the servers. So there's a lot of different things that the people don't think about those. They are not secure. They, they, are, not, they are afraid to change, make the changes because something might go haywire and then they have a bigger mess at their hand. Or they don't care. And stupidity is a, is a big reason for all, all these kind of things too. So the, uh, but the best way for you is to select that kind of data center that are progressive. Move your money. I have the, I've, I've always said that there's the golden rule. The, he who has the gold makes the rules. So if you can make a change in the data center, for example, then favor those data centers that 
do things better. Vote with your money. And the other data centers will follow when they start to find out that they don't get customers that easily anymore. There's a few questions about, uh, like, you mentioned this also during the speech about the like AI and all these new cool uh, tools. What's the impact on the energy consumption? That is a good question. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure whether anybody yet knows the, the. I'm. I'm planning to dig, dig deeper deeper into those. For example, the, the AI, the chat GPT, I think that most of <coughs> us have been having chats with that one, has so big data model that you need to use the whole memory of the GPU or the whole memory of the system to have the data model that is like 130 gigabytes or something like that. So loading it to the server and offloading it from the server takes time and you can't splice the server to anything else but the AI. So for example, all the servers that are built for the AI cannot be used anything else than AI when the AI is not used that frequently. So it has these kind of differences also. So, and the, how much GPUs, when you, when you look at the NVIDIA's new cards, they are very thick. They are like a half of my car already, the size. And, uh, and most of that is cooling. So probably it consumes a lot of energy. And the, the training of training and the feedback loops of the AIs, AIs training each other and all of that. There is a lot of energy used, but how much? That is a good question. Nobody really knows yet. There was a study made by University of Lappeenranta that they uh, compared different AI models and different parameters, and they found out that the, there is a very big difference between the models, and then also that the, those systems that use the most energy don't always produce the best answer. So it might be that you could scale down the AI's sort of thresholds, and it actually produces better results than that it, you sort of turn the knob to the 11. And, and then think that now, now it has the most preciseness and a lot of energy consumed. So very complicated matter. There's uh, a few also really practical questions um, that I think are quite relevant uh, for our day-to-day -day -day work. Is that, uh, well, based on your experience, how would you host a web app for example, like e-commerce site, uh, as green as possible. I mean, you can choose like your hosting provider, I guess the uh, Microsoft and AWS, and, and, and they have, um, I mean, I, I think at some point at AWS, for example, they, they didn't use uh, green energy. Yeah. Uh, but is there something else as well? Uh, the from the big three cloud servers, Microsoft is doing the best, then Google is almost as good one, and then there's a big gap before Amazon right now. They are doing a lot of things, but that, <coughs> if I put it bluntly, and why wouldn't I put it bluntly, it's not in the DNA of Amazon because they want to make money. So the, uh, it's, it's not easy for their culture, I would say. Maybe they're getting better. Hopefully they are getting better. At least they have some initiatives. So that's one thing. The other one is to, to reduce bandwidth, reduce the libraries, reduce code. Uh, and uh, think that whether the best way, for example, is a single page app right now, if you need to do also the for Google and the others, you need to do the, uh, the server-side rendering and so forth. So you might end up having a lot of, a lot of, uh, or you have a lot of different options right now, and then figuring out that what is best for that business case depends on the size of the business case, the amount of people coming to the website, uh, the error proneness of the process, and so forth. That what is the best way to do it? But if you are conscious and if you are sort of awake, in a sense, in these matters, then you make better choices than you would not if you are not conscious. But then it's up to you to figure out that what's, what's best in that case. I, there's no hard and fast rules, except that reduce 
the data, reduce the code, and but then how to do it? It's a good question. Yeah. And how would you actually sell the, that idea to the business? It's faster, it's less error prone. Uh, the speed of website is the major, uh, major complaint or major user experience issue that if it's slow, then people hate to use it. So uh, the fastness is also energy efficient mm -hmm. unless you do it with, uh, with uh, sort of that you preload everything in the first load and then it's really fast. Yeah. Is there any, any way to kind of um, sh show some numbers to the business um, in the sense that what's the, because they, they, they have, you know, this is our backlog for, you know, next <laughs> six months and we didn't count these changes uh, into it, uh, how can you uh, convince them to say that, hey, come on, this is the amount of money we, uh, we make and money we save? Uh, I would, that the, for example, that if there's a, the bandwidth bill from the, from the uh, let's say, Azure, that this is amount of bandwidth, and we say that we can cut 20% out of it. There's immediate saving. Uh, if there's uh, the processing bill, and we could say that by if you if you reduce the amount of amount of analytics data that we collect that nobody's seemingly been using, we could get these kind of savings, and so forth. But you need to know the numbers, and that's not the typically the uh, the where the developers shine, but you need to have a project manager or analyst or, or product owner to dig up those numbers. Sometimes the clients are not willing to give those numbers because they think that then the developers get the upper hand and, and, and so forth. So there's, again, no easy way to do it. But then, for example, that the one way to think that the would be that how many page transitions you need to do. And if you can cut some of those, then you cut also the customer churn because every single link the user needs to click reduces the amount of people that will go through the funnel. So if you can squeeze the funnel from five steps to three steps, you will make more money. And that's the, how, the, how the funnels work in real world. And there's probably there's studies from the psychology and that can sort of back those up, those claims. So again, different options for different situations and uh, being uh, thoughtful and, uh, and sort of thinking it from different angles is the best way to say, and then there might be something, okay, th now this makes sense. And with the, that is also with the, with the, uh, what, what we, especially, especially Sato was discussing about the compensation, that the compensation makes all the emissions a cost. And then you can, with the CFO, you can say, that, okay, we can reduce the compensation cost by re reducing the energy used. And that, that make sense and they said yes yes now you're talking my language so if you can turn it to euros somehow then the euros will start to have their life of their own in a sense and then the uh, the facts behind the euros are sort of not scrutinized that much anymore let's put it this way um I think we're we're 10 minutes over time so maybe we can fin <laughs> finish with the one question for for maybe this is more for you, Sato, uh, how to measure or calculate your personal energy consumption? Well, I haven't done it yet. I'm about to, but um, <clears throat> I would use the same um, method I've been using for our company. Um, for my uh, travelings, it's pretty easy. Uh, I can check the emails from a Finnish railway company and calculate Actually, Finnish railway, railway company is nowadays carbon neutral, so I don't even have to do that. But I can check how many kilometers I have driven our car. I can uh, check the uh, heating bills of our house, which is, by the way, a Rintamamiestalo, which is an old um, house built after the Second World War. It's so cozy, so impractical. Um, not the most efficient place to live in when you think about the uh, global warming and energy consumption, but, well, like we've been saying, we are not perfect, and, and 
we try to improve. But I, I would say the calculations are not so complicated if you are not trying to include everything. If you just concentrate on the main things, then, then it's not complicated. Yeah, the 80-20 rules or 90-10 rules is, is sort of applied there. And then one hint is to use carbon neutral services. Mm -hmm. Truly carbon neutral services and not like that they have, they have only scope and one, one and two calculated, but all, all three scopes. Uh, and for the previous questions also, the, uh, the IFRS, the, the accounting standard will make it, make all the companies using that standard that they need to calculate the carbon balances in few years to come. And then if your company as a service provider to them is a carbon neutral, then you can say that, okay, that calculation is really fast, that it's zero, and then move forward. And same with your own life, that if you select, for example, Elisa or Telia, the, the Finnish net, uh, the, uh, communication networks, they are carbon neutral. Instead of DNA, that is not carbon neutral, then you have, okay, that my communication zero, my uh, train travel zero, my that and that zero, zero. Then you make your calculations way easier. And then also favor those companies that are doing better than the others. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, there's tons and tons of questions not <laughs> asked uh, because we ran out of time. But maybe you two will stick around uh, in the conference area and you can try to take them hostage uh, <laughs> and ask your questions there. Uh, super interesting topic, very relevant for all of us. So let's get give one more. <laughs>